I was here four years ago, and I remember at the time that the talks weren't put online. I think they were given to Tedsters in a box, a box set of DVDs, which they put on their shelves where they are now. <laughs> and actually, Chris called me uh, a week after I'd given my talk and said, we're going to start putting them online. Could we put yours online? I said, sure. Um, and four years later, as he said, it's been seen by four, well, it's been downloaded four million times. So I suppose you could multiply that by 20 or something to get the number of people who've seen it. And as Chris says, there is a hunger um, for videos of me. <laughs> you know. Don't you feel? <laughs> so this whole event has been an elaborate build-up to me doing another one for you, so here it is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Al Gore spoke at the TED conference I spoke at four years ago and talked about the climate crisis, and I referenced that at the end of my last talk. So I want to pick up from there, because I only had 18 minutes, frankly. And <laughs> so as I was saying... <laughs> uh, <laughs> You see, he's right. I mean, there is a major climate crisis, obviously. And I think if people don't believe it, they should get out more. Um, <laughs> but I believe there's a second climate crisis, which is as severe, which has the same origins, and that we have to deal with with the same urgency. And I mean by this, and you may, you may say, by the way, look, I'm good. You know, I, <laughs> I have one climate crisis. Uh, I don't really need the second one. Um, but this is a crisis of not natural resources, though I believe that's true, but a crisis of human resources. I believe fundamentally, as many speakers have said during the past few days, that we make very poor use of our talents. Very many people go through their whole lives having no real sense of what their talents may be, or if they have any to speak of. I meet all kinds of people who don't think they're really good at anything. Actually, I kind of divide the world into two groups now. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, the great utilitarian philosopher, uh, once spiked this argument. You know, he said there are two types of people in this world, those who divide the world into two types and those who do not. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I do. And <laughs> I meet all kinds of people who don't enjoy what they do. They simply go through their lives getting on with it. Uh, they get no great pleasure from what they do. They endure it rather than enjoy it and wait for the weekend. But I also meet people who love what they do and couldn't imagine doing anything else. If you said to them, don't do this anymore, they'd wonder what you're talking about. Because it isn't what they do, it's who they are. They say, but this is me. You know, it would be foolish for me to abandon this because it speaks to my most authentic self. And it's not true of enough people. In fact, on the contrary, I think it's still true of a minority of people. And I think there are many possible explanations for it. And high among them is education. Because education, in a way, dislocates very many people from their natural talents. And human resources are like natural resources. They're often buried deep. You have to go looking for them. They're not just lying around on the surface. You have to create the circumstances where they show themselves. And you might imagine education would be the way that happens, but too often it's not. Every education system in the world is being reformed at the moment, and it's not enough. Reform is no use anymore, because that's simply improving a broken model. What we need, and the word's been used many times during the course of the past few days, is not evolution, but a revolution in education. This has to be transformed into something else.
One of the real challenges is to innovate fundamentally in education. Innovation is hard because it means doing something that people don't find very easy for the most part. It means challenging what we take for granted, things that we think are obvious. Um, the great problem for reform or transformation is the tyranny of common sense. Things that people think, well, they can't be done any other way because that's the way it's done. I came across a great quote recently from Abraham Lincoln, who I thought you'd be pleased to have quoted at this point. <laughs> he, uh, he said this in December 1862 to the second annual meeting of Congress. I ought to explain that I had no idea what was happening at the time. Uh, we don't teach American history in Britain. <laughs> we suppress it. You know, this is our policy, so... <laughs> so no doubt something fascinating is happening in December 1862, which the Americans among us will be aware of. But, but he said this. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. I love that, not rise to it, rise with it. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. I love that word, disenthrall. You know what he means, that there are ideas that all of us are enthralled to, which we simply take for granted as the natural order of things, the way things are. And many of our ideas have been formed not to meet the circumstances of this century, but to cope with the circumstances of previous centuries. But our minds are still hypnotized by them. And we have to disenthrall ourselves of some of them. Now, doing this is easier said than done. It's very hard to know, by the way, what it is you take for granted. And the reason is that you take it for granted. <laughs> so let me ask you something you may take for granted. How many of you here are over the age of 25? That's not what I think you take for granted. I'm sure you're familiar with that already, but... <laughs> are there any people here under the age of 25? Great. Now, those over 25, could you put your hands up if you're wearing a wristwatch? Now, that's a great deal of us, isn't it? Um, ask a room full of teenagers the same thing. Teenagers do not wear wristwatches. I don't mean they can't or they're not allowed to, they just often choose not to. And the reason is, you see, that we were brought up in a pre-digital culture, those of us over 25, and so for us, if you want to know the time, you have to wear something to tell it. Kids now live in a world which is digitized, and the time for them is everywhere. They see no reason to do this. And by the way, you don't need to do it either, it's just that you've always done it, and you carry on doing it. My daughter never wears a watch. My daughter Kate, who's 20, she doesn't see the point. You know, as she says, you know, like, it's a single-function device. You know, like... <laughs> Like, how lame is that? You know, and, I, and I say, no, no, it tells the date as well. You know, it's, <laughs> it, has, it has multiple functions. But you see, there are things we're enthralled to in education. Let me give you a couple of examples. One of them is the idea of linearity. That it starts here, and you go through a track, and if you do everything right, you will end up set for the rest of your life. Um, Everybody who's spoken at TED has told us implicitly or sometimes explicitly a different story. That life is not linear, it's organic. We create our lives symbiotically as we explore our talents in relation to the circumstances they help to create for us. But you know, we have become obsessed with this linear narrative. And probably the pinnacle for education is getting you to college. I think we are obsessed with getting people to college. Certain sorts of college, I don't mean you shouldn't go to college, but not everybody needs to go, and not everybody needs to go now. Maybe they go later, not right away. I was up in San Francisco a while ago doing a book signing. Um, there was this guy buying a book. He was in his 30s, and I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm a fireman. And I said, uh, how long have you been a fireman? He said, always. I've always been a fireman. And I said, well, when did you decide? He said, as a kid. He said, actually, it was a problem for me at school, because at school, Everybody wanted to be a fireman. He said, I wanted to be a fireman. You know, and, and he said, when I got to the senior year of school, uh, my teachers didn't take it seriously. This one teacher didn't take it seriously. He said, I was throwing my life away 
if that's all I chose to do with it. That I should go to college, I should become a professional person, I had great potential, and I was wasting my talent to do that. And he said it was humiliating because he said it in front of the whole class, and I really felt dreadful. But it's what I wanted. And I, as soon as I left school, I applied to the fire service, and I was accepted. And he said, you know, I was thinking about that guy recently, just a few minutes ago when you were speaking about this teacher. He said, because six months ago, I saved his life. <laughs> he said he was in a car wreck, and I pulled him out, gave him CPR, and I saved his wife's life as well. He said, I think he thinks better of me now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Human communities depend upon a diversity of talent, not a singular conception of ability. And at the heart of our challenges, <laughs> at the heart of the challenge is to reconstitute our sense of ability and of intelligence. This linearity thing is a problem. When I arrived in LA a few years, about nine years ago, I came across a, um, a policy statement, very well intentioned, which said college begins in kindergarten. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. If we had time, I could go into this, but we don't. <laughs> kindergarten begins in kindergarten. <laughs> A friend of mine once said, you know, a three-year-old is not half a six-year-old. <laughs> They're three. But as we just heard in this last session, there's such competition now to get in, into kindergarten, to get to the right kindergarten, that people are being interviewed for it at three. Kids sitting in front of unimpressed panels, you know, with their resumes. <laughs> flicking through it, saying, what, this is it? <laughs> you've been around for 36 months and this is it? <laughs> you know, you've... <laughs> you've achieved nothing. I mean, it's... <laughs> spent the first six months breastfeeding, what I can say. It's... <laughs> I mean... <laughs> See, it's outrageous as a conception, but it tracks through. The other big issue is conformity. We have built our education systems on the model of fast food. This is something Jamie Oliver talked about the other day. You know, there are two models of quality assurance in catering. One is fast food, where everything is standardized. The other are things like Zagat and Michelin restaurants, where everything is not standardized. They're customized to local circumstances. And we have sold ourselves into a fast food model of education. And it's impoverishing our spirits and our energies as much as fast food is depleting our physical bodies. I think we have to recognize a couple of things here. One is that human talent is tremendously diverse. People have very different aptitudes. I worked out recently that I was given a, a guitar as a kid at about the same time that Eric Clapton got his first guitar. <laughs> you know, it worked out for Eric, that's all I'm saying. You know, <laughs> in a way, it did not for me. I could not get this thing to work, you know. No matter how often and how hard I blew into it, you know, it just <laughs> wouldn't work. But it's not only about that, it's about passion. Often people are good at things they don't really care for. It's about passion and what excites our spirit and our energy. And if you're doing the thing that you love to do, that you're good at, time takes a different course entirely. Uh, my wife's just finished writing a novel, and uh, it's a, I think it's a great book. But she disappears for hours on end. You know this, if you're doing something you love, an hour feels like five minutes. If you're doing something that doesn't resonate with your spirit, five minutes feels like an hour. And the reason so many people are opting out of education is because it doesn't feed their spirit. It doesn't feed their energy or their passion. So I think we have to change metaphors. We have to go from what is essentially an industrial model of education, a manufacturing model, which is based on linearity and conformity and batching people. We have to move to a model that is based more on principles of agriculture. We have to recognize that human flourishing is not a mechanical process, it's an organic process. And you cannot predict the outcome 
of human development. All you can do is, like a farmer, is create the conditions under which they will begin to flourish. So when we look at reforming education and transforming it, it isn't like cloning a system. There are great ones, like KIPS. It's a great system. There are many great um, models. It's about customizing them to your circumstances and personalizing education to the people you're actually teaching. And doing that, I think, is the answer to the future, because it's not about scaling a new solution. It's about creating a movement in education in which people develop their own solutions, but with external support based on a personalized curriculum. Now, in this room, there are people who represent extraordinary resources in business, in multimedia, uh, in the internet. These technologies, combined with extraordinary talents of teachers, provide an opportunity to revolutionize education. And I urge you to get involved in it, because it's vital not just to ourselves, but to the future of our children. But we have to change from the industrial model to an agricultural model where each school can be flourishing tomorrow. That's where children experience life, or at home if that's where they choose to be educated with their families or their friends. There's been a lot of talk about dreams over the course of this uh, few days. And I wanted just to, very quickly, um, I was very struck by Natalie Merchant's songs last night, recovering old poems. I wanted to read you a quick, very short poem from W.B. Yeats, who some of you may know. He wrote this to his um, love, Maud Gone. Um, and he was um, bewailing the fact that he couldn't really give her what he thought she wanted from him. And he says, I've got something else, but it may not be for you. He says this, Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, inwrought with gold and silver light, of blue and the dim and the dark cloths, of night and light and the half-light, I would spread the cloths under your feet, but I being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. And every day, everywhere, our children spread their dreams beneath our feet. And we should tread softly. Thank you. Thank you very much. The precision of a watch is a function of its movement. For Rolex and for Hans Wilsdorf, to guarantee the precision of a timepiece, the pressing question was how to protect the movement itself from the elements, not only water, but also tiny particles of dust. In 1926, a major step was taken with the creation of the world's first waterproof and dustproof wristwatch. The Rolex Oyster was born. Over the years, subtle changes in the design continue to improve the Oyster, adding more comfort while keeping the style contemporary. And along with style, more functions have been added. A Rolex wristwatch was the first to show the date through a small aperture on the face. It was also the first wristwatch to spell out the day of the week in full. In the early 1950s, Rolex developed professional watches whose functions went far beyond telling the time. Launched in 1953, the Submariner was the first Rolex watch guaranteed waterproof to a depth of 100 meters. Already on an incredible journey of innovation and design, Rolex decided to push the boundaries even further. In 1960, the Bathyscaphe Trieste and Rolex made history. 
the submersible successfully dived to 10,916 meters below the surface of the ocean. A Rolex deep sea special was strapped to the outside. The development of undersea exploration led to the launching in 1967 of the Sea Dweller 2000, waterproof to a depth of 610 meters. In 2008, fitted with the patented Rolex Ringlock system, the Rolex Deep Sea safely descends to 3,900 meters. The Submariner continues to evolve. In 2008, the model in gold is redesigned and features a new unidirectional rotatable bezel with a serochrome disc. And two years later, the steel Submariner is introduced with a green color combination. Rolex has incorporated countless hours and more than a century of experience, years of research, innovation and development into every one of its models. And the benefits arising from this work, including waterproofness, precision and durability, are the result of Rolex's continuous pursuit of perfection. From the most elegant and prestigious models to the professional timepieces, all are exquisitely crafted. Piece by piece, we design and manufacture every single watch. And the story continues.